1. I had recently moved from Adelaide to Melbourne to live with my boyfriend, now husband, in a share house unit with one of his friends and his friend's girlfriend. I'll call her Nikita for this story as she was involved. My boyfriend and his friend were at work, Nikita and I were at home. This was in a small two-story, two-bedroom unit in a beautiful, family-friendly suburb, close to a local shopping mall. We loved our neighbours, the street and area in general, and had never had any issues prior to this. Both the bedrooms were upstairs, Nikita was sleeping in, and I had just made my way downstairs into our kitchen and lounge room. This was also the main room of the unit, with the front door, back door and garage door on different walls of the room. It happened around 10am. I can't explain how quickly the following events occurred, but it was all very sudden. I was standing at the sink, about to fill the kettle, when I heard the garage door open. My first thought was, it must be Nikita in the garage. We smoked out there and not in the house, so I walked around the fridge to greet her. No more than two meters in front of me was a man rushing into the room. He yelled, What the fuck is going on? We later laughed at this, saying we should have asked him that. As I had a split second to process what was happening and register his face before turning and running for my best escape route, which in my mind was the stairs. The front door was closer but deadbolted and Nikita was upstairs. No way I'd leave her there. I ran as fast as I could, almost tripping over myself, and the steps as my legs felt like concrete jelly. If you can imagine that. As I reached the top of the stairs and Nikita's bedroom door, I burst into her room, slammed the door and leaned against it, chest heaving. I yelled for her to wake up. Nikita, where's your phone? Wake up! There's a man in the house! I half screamed, half cried. She sat up groggily asking, What? There's a man in the house! Where's your phone? Her eyes widened in terror as she saw me against the door. It had no lock. I heard nothing and figured we could make it to the bathroom which had a lock opposite her bedroom. The bathroom, now! We didn't even question it. Just threw her door open and dashed into the next room. As I dialed the police, we heard heavy footsteps coming up the wooden stairs. By now, we were both hysterical. I was begging the operator to send someone immediately as the guy was coming to find us. He must have heard us on the phone to the cops because after a pause, we heard hurried thumping down the steps again. The cops were there within two minutes, as they were only three streets away. We heard sirens, the operator told us the police were there and it was safe to come out. They didn't find the guy. I gave a full description as best as I could from the glimpse I caught, and was later asked to go to the police station to help construct an image to identify him. He was not that much taller than me, around 5'4", I'm guessing mid-40s, bald in the middle with shaved hair around the sides of his head, wire-framed glasses, stubble goatee and dark, beady eyes. Fleecy zip neck sweater. Didn't get a good look at his pants. The scariest details came later. We realized the guy hadn't stolen anything. There were easily accessible items he could have taken in a hurry, our laptop, my phone, which was closer to him than me when he entered, and nothing was taken from the garage. Another thing, there was no forced entry. The garage door to the house can only be accessed from inside the house or garage. He had opened the electric roller shutter to the garage and then entered the house via the door. That roller shutter could only be opened from inside, manually, or outside with a remote control, which my boyfriend and his friend were never given when they moved in six months prior. I showed the identity sketch to our neighbors to alert them and a group of women next door, a mum, her sister, and the lady's 16-year-old daughter, said he looked 99% like the previous tenant of our unit. We notified the police, as well as giving the names of three different people's mail still delivered to our house, plus told our house agents. We checked the lease agreement, which stated the house keys and garage remote control were to be included. Only the keys were signed for. The remote control had been missing. Scarier still, a week or so later, some detectives came to the door to ask if I'd seen or heard anything more. I told them no. They handed me their card and left. I learned they were investigating sexual predators. I felt sick knowing that. I told Nikita and our neighbors we all kept a close eye on things, but nothing more came of it, thankfully. I just wonder if they ever found the guy before he threatened anyone else. 2. Not long ago, my partner and I were driving through reservation land at about 11 o'clock at night 
in the desert southwest of the USA. We were on a major highway, but as with so many highways in that area, it's not very well used, just barely paved and with only one lane going in each direction. No lights, just reflectors in the pavement. It's not uncommon to go for an hour on this highway without seeing another vehicle. I was reading a book aloud when suddenly my buddy who was driving interrupts and pulls off the side of the road, braking quickly. Did you see that? No, I replied. See what? That van! It went off the road! I turned in my seat but couldn't make out anything on or off the road. It was just darkness all around. He grabbed the flashlight that we keep in the car and asked me to call 911. He's in a medical profession and a lapse license EMT, and I've worked in emergency response, so this isn't a super uncommon occurrence for us. Although not being able to see the accident was a first for me. I got on the phone with 911 immediately and set about trying to find a mile marker using my phone as a flashlight. Eventually, settling for giving them approximate GPS coordinates, as I had very little coverage and my GPS was acting flighty in that area. The dispatcher asked me to cross the highway carefully and try to ascertain the status of the passengers, since they had gone straight over a hill and presumably into the canyon below. I stayed on the line while I trudged over the sand dunes on the opposite side of the highway. I was a bit nervous to be walking in this area in sandals, as we had just recently been discussing the rattlesnake population in the region, and I couldn't really see where I was going and answer the dispatcher questions at the same time. But the scrubby vegetation gave me some purchase and I finally crested the largest dune, and could see the outline of the accident site. On the road the moonlight was blocked by the dunes, but on this side it was strangely bright. It took my brain a moment to make sense of what I was seeing. They had been lucky. The van had turned on its side as it slid, and the friction from the dunes had just barely prevented the entire thing from going over the edge into the massive canyon below. My partner called out to me and asked me to check on the woman in the van, and I saw that next to him, standing with scarecrow-like stiffness, was a young man. He looked dazed, and didn't seem to be answering many questions. I got the darkest vibe off that guy that I've ever encountered. I felt goosebumps crawling on my back, and it was just like there was a permanent ring of shadow around him. I felt uneasy knowing that either of us were anywhere near him, and made a point to keep visually checking up on them. I proceeded to the site and around the van, and called out to identify myself. I heard the voice of a woman inside, and as I walked around the windshield, I could see her. She was crouched in the passenger cabin, clearly in shock, her feet bleeding as she shifted back and forth in the broken glass of the driver's side window. A tall, willowy woman, thin and pale, with dark hair. There was also a massive wolfhound panting. It appeared equally stunned. I saw that they had managed to pry the passenger side door open, and the man must have climbed out through the top that way. The woman spoke with me for a time, calmly and with an urgency I couldn't quite identify in her voice, and I relayed the information to the dispatcher. Yes, it's just the two of them. No, they don't seem to be seriously injured. No, nobody had fallen asleep at the wheel. They were on their way to Texas to visit family. They were living out of the van. What I remember most clearly is that I made a couple of attempts to convince her to either climb out of the roof or through the back to clear away from the van just to be safe. But she politely refused each time. She said she didn't want to leave the dog. There was something just wrong about her demeanor. People react differently to stress and she seemed alert and competent, so I put it to the back of my mind. But I kept being struck by a strangeness in her handling of the situation. Dispatch and I agreed that the paramedics could probably easily break the windshield to free them, and there was no sign of fuel, so it was fine for her to stay in there until they arrived. Once I double-checked that she was secure and wasn't going anywhere, I handed off the phone to my partner while I went out to wave in the paramedics, who had accidentally passed the site and were backing towards us from farther up the highway, looking for our flashlight thanks to the dispatcher. They pulled up a ways off from the site and I began to brief them, and then we all heard dispatch come over the radio. Please be advised a male passenger is AMS and considered dangerous. AMS stands for Altered Mental Status, suggesting that someone isn't in the normal frame of mind for any variety of reasons. We all stopped in our tracks, the paramedics exchanged a glance and one went back to the ambulance for additional equipment. I was eager to get back to my partner to make sure he hadn't communicated that to dispatch, out of concern for his safety. But when we arrived on site, they were still talking quietly. 
I went to my car to find shoes for the woman. The passengers were placed in different ambulances, and the police arrived to take interviews all around. Just as we were about to leave, an officer taking our statements turned to us and said, It's real messed up. I guess she was driving and he wanted to kill them both. So he grabbed the wheel and overpowered her. It's lucky either of them are alive. After a couple of hours when we were back to driving, my partner proceeded to fill in the details. When he first got to the scene, the woman was yelling that he had tried to kill her and not to leave her alone with him. She also said that if he got out, he needed to be restrained as he was a danger to himself and others. The man was very eager to be out of the vehicle. Bewildered, my partner had nonetheless helped the guy pry the door open. And once he was out, the guy had just clammed up and wouldn't do much more than nod or shake his head in response to questions. He kept thinking that the guy might take off and get lost in the desert, but in the end he had waited. He said the guy had seemed agitated, so he was doing his best to keep him engaged and distracted until help could arrive. It was chilling to realize that what we had thought was an accident was actually a murder-suicide attempt. I really wanted to accompany the woman to the hospital, but for unrelated reasons we couldn't remain. We went back that way during the day on our return trip a week later. We pulled over at the site and climbed over the dunes to see whether they had managed to tow the van over all that sand, and sure enough it was gone. What was unnerving was the realization, upon seeing the landscape during the day, that if he had chosen any other spot to grab the wheel, for miles in both directions, they would have been over a cliff almost immediately. In the dark there was no way for him to tell, but he had chosen the only spot where they realistically could have survived the accident. My partner then told me that they had gone off the road when they were nearly opposite our little sedan on the highway. If the guy had opted for a head-on collision instead of the off-the-cliff option, we would have been toast. It was a sobering thought. I think of the woman I met that night often, and of her wolfhound being gingerly coaxed into the back of a police car. I really hope they're in a much better place now. As for that guy who tried to kill them all, I certainly hope that he gets help and that we never have cause to meet again. 3. This happened a couple years ago, but I feel like I'm ready to talk about it. In 2016, I had just turned 18 and was in my second semester of community college. I was lucky to get to take a few specialized classes that were requirements for my major. These classes required me to drive about 45 minutes every Monday, Wednesday and Friday to the main campus of my community college system. That's relevant because I was going to a town that I didn't know much about and didn't know anyone who lived there. There was a man in my class named Eddie. He was a big guy in his late 40s, I'm five foot nothing, and at the time was about 130 pounds, which is just to say, I was pretty small and defenseless. We spent a lot of time in the lab for these classes and he was stationed right across from me. I was a bit more naive and unsuspecting at the time and wanted to be nice. So I talked with him and my other classmates quite a bit, and was a lot friendlier to him than I would be nowadays. He started being overly friendly to me and would stand too close and ask too many personal questions. He'd flirt with me in class to the point it seemed to make other people uncomfortable to watch. He also started staring at me, a lot, with an intense look that scared me. Of course, being young and not wanting to hurt his feelings, I decided to ignore it as best as I could. I told my boyfriend about it, but again, Eddie hadn't actually done anything to me, so there wasn't a lot I felt like I could do. A few weeks after that started, all of us were hanging out in a small break room type area, studying for an exam in our next class, which was about 30 minutes away. I was sitting on one table chatting with some middle-aged women in my class, and Eddie was at the next table over messing with his phone. I announced that I was going to get something from the vending machine and stood up. As I did, he tried and failed to discreetly turn his phone toward me and snapped pictures of me as I walked to the machine, got my drink, and bent over to pick it up. I realized what was going on as I was walking back to my seat with him still taking photos. I shot him a look. He put his phone away and just sat there staring at me. I was trying to look pissed, but honestly, I was just really freaked out. I excused myself from the table and called my boyfriend near tears. 
telling him what happened. He was angry and said I needed to tell someone, but I said no. I didn't want to make a scene. He tried to comfort me as much as he could, but I had to go to class soon afterwards. Our last class finished at about 9pm, and since it was January, it was completely dark out when we all walked to our cars. I was actually texting one of my guy friends about what had happened when Eddie walked up to my car. He stopped for a second and looked at me through my windshield, then slowly kept walking, watching me through my driver's side window the whole time. He was parked nowhere near me, and the wind chill was below zero, so he had to have made a point to walk by my car like that. I was terrified, and with my hands shaking, I started my car and drove home as fast as I could, calling my boyfriend on the way and crying. After that, I decided I needed to talk to my professor about what was going on. I was so nervous, but I asked her the next week if I could talk to her privately when class was over. We went to her office and I told her about Eddie and what he had done, and how he acted weird toward me. She told me that she had noticed I tensed up and went quiet when he got close to me, and had noticed him paying a lot of attention to me, and told me she believed me about the pictures. She was honestly amazing with how she handled it. She promised me that she would move things around where I'd be away from him in the lab, and asked if I wanted her to talk to him about it. I said no that I didn't want to make him angry and she said that she'd respect that. But she was going to have a security guard stand at the door and watch me go to my car every night. And that she'd tell the program director what was going on, but Eddie wouldn't know that I had talked to her. By the time we got done, it had been about 30 minutes since class had ended, and she offered to walk me outside. I'm glad that she did, because when we came out of the elevator to the first floor, Eddie was sitting in the foyer alone. Everyone else had gone home. My blood ran cold and I tried to act as normal as I could. He seemed as surprised to see our professor as she was to see him. She asked why he was still here and he said he had noticed my car was still parked out front and wanted to make sure I didn't have to walk out by myself. I am pretty sure I was pale as a ghost but my professor gave him a look that I couldn't read and said not to worry. She's walking me to my car and from now on the security guard will be there every night. He said that was good, and quickly said goodnight and left. It still chills me to think about what could have happened if my professor didn't walk me down to my car that night. I have no idea what he was capable of doing. After this, she rearranged our seating, made sure we were never grouped together, and I started making sure that I walked out to my car at the same time as a few other women in my class. The security guard was usually in the foyer, and we only had a couple of months left of class. So there weren't really any other incidents. But I still caught him staring at me sometimes, and he looked like pure rage. It's been a few years, I don't go to that school anymore, and I'm moving to a completely different city soon. I'm a lot more assertive and stronger now. But Eddie, you fucking creep. Let's not meet again. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 343. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Well, I come to you on November 5th, well, that's when this is recorded, uh, which means Bonfire Night, a Guy Fox Night, where we celebrate... I'm not entirely sure what we're celebrating. Are we celebrating that he tried to blow up Parliament? Or are we celebrating that they killed him afterwards? Either way... I'm kind of iffy on the whole thing. But it is the night of the year, including the weeks leading up to it, and let's be honest, the weeks the weeks after it, right up until New Year, uh, where people spend all their, their hard-earned cash to annoy the people in their neighbourhood. Not a fan, as you, as you may be getting. Uh, usually doesn't bother me too much, except I, I was sitting last night, I was thinking, should I record right now? I really wasn't in the mood for it, I thought, I'm... I'm Still having a little bit of throat trouble. Thankfully, it hasn't gotten majorly bad. I'm still able to record. As you can hear, I actually don't sound too bad, I think. I was thinking, but should I usually do on a Sunday? I'll, I'll knock a little bit of audio out, and then I'll finish everything else off on the Monday and make the videos then. I was sitting thinking, do I want to do that? No, I, I just I should rest. I should rest my voice. Because I had noticed my voice had improved a little bit on Sunday versus where it was on the, on the Friday. Well, you know, the resting Saturday it helps. Okay, I should rest. 
but then oh there's going to be all that noise tomorrow night and um, you, you can maybe hear a little bit of it in the background I'm not sure. I mean, this has been going on for hours, by the way. I woke up really late today because because um, I was expecting a delivery. And uh, the delivery I've been expecting since uh, last month. And I finally got it today, so that was fine. Uh, so I eventually got to sleep late. So I woke up late. So I woke up at 8 o'clock and all this noise and flashing and everything, everything has been going on since then. Uh... So I realised Monday isn't going to be a great day to record, but I figured, you know what, it's just... Surely it won't be going on all night. But it's just... Well, it's actually just gone 11 o'clock at night here, and they're still at it. <sighs> Hopefully it'll stop soon. So if there was any boom sounds, I think I caught most of them. So hopefully you won't hear much of anything. But if you hear any boom sounds in the backgrounds on the audio, that's what it is. People having fun with fireworks. And... Well, actually, well, I'll rant a little bit more. What does annoy me is I know I complain a lot about dogs and things barking in my neighbourhood. And, and they're at it tonight. But I feel bad for them tonight because they're... They're... they're well, how do I put this politely? <clears throat> I'm not a pet. I'm not, I'm not a pet person, but I'm, I, I do like animals. I just don't want to own one. So they're... Um, misguided owners, perhaps? They're... Um, Really trying to think of the polite way to say this without cursing. Uh, let's just say misguided. Yes, we hear you. Well done. <sighs> I haven't taken their dogs inside. Though the poor little woofers are outside. Terrified. I mean, I know my sister's dog doesn't do well with the fireworks. Poor little guy. Uh, and you can tell it takes the, the, the toll on them. They're getting stressed out by all the, the booms and everything. And it's just not fair. The dog should be inside. That sometimes I think there's like medication you can get to help keep the dogs calm, or they should just be sitting with their owners to help to help calm them down and keep them because it's very very it's a very bad time for a lot of a lot of pets, not just dogs. <sighs> okay, grumble's over. I'm gonna head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>